Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses. As we conclude with part 63, The Kabbalah and Mysticism, Book 8, The Kabbalah and Other Channels of Esoteric Tradition by Arthur Edward Waite. 6. The Kabbalah and Mysticism. It is a task of no inconsiderable difficulty to attempt a judgment upon the Kabbalah from the purely mystic standpoint. On the one hand, the history of Kabbalism is so embedded in that of mysticism that it is scarcely known or admitted in any distinct connection. On the other hand, to the pure mystic, there is so much in the Kabbalistic system which seems extrinsic to the subject of mysticism that there is a temptation to underrate its real influence. The correspondence and the difference may perhaps be brought into harmony if it be permissible to regard mysticism in two ways as a philosophical system. That is to say, an ordered metaphysics held intellectually, but also as a mode of conduct practiced with a defined purpose in a word as transcendental doctrine and transcendental life. The practical mystic is the saint on the path of his ascent into the mystery of the eternal union, concerning whom it is consonant with the purpose of our present inquiry to speak only with great reservation, because the mysteries of the divine life do not fall within the limits of historical research. I conceive that the sum of Kabbalistic instruction is of no real service to the disciple of this secret path after every allowance has been made for the Zoharic doctrine that a science of that holy unity into which all things return, as all come forth therefrom, can be attained by man. Invenit sanctum. Like all other studies, and perhaps not more so than any other methodized theosophy, it has a certain office in the sanctum facet. For that far larger class to whom the possibility of sanctity is denied, who are in search rather of a guide for thought upon questions of fundamental philosophy, I conceive that the Kabbalah, but again, like other metaphysics, has some useful and reassuring lights. It is a source of intellectual consolation that one of the most barren of all the ways pursued by the human mind has its own strange flowers and fruit. There is no book and there is no system to which this moderate office can be denied. It is also, as I have sought to show, something more than an inheritance from the past, even an inheritance that has been transmitted from a period far back in human history. The Zohar, at least, has the power of stirring those depths in the human heart which are beyond the plummet of the sense. It seems occasionally to strike beyond all time and backwards sweep through all intelligence. And to say this is to confess that it is the eternal soul speaking here under the common influence of right reason, there in ecstasy and vision, and again as it would seem in somnambulism or even in frenzy. Now the speech of the human soul in what state soever must be a message to the mystic. There is no need to add that on the philosophical side the Kabbalah connects assuredly with mysticism. With occultism, of course, it connects wholly throughout all its history. The difference between occultism and mysticism is much more than that of a Latin equivalent for a Greek term, as might appear at first sight. We are all acquainted with the distinction which is made between the magnetic and hypnotic sleep. They have much in common, but they are pathologically separate, having diverse characteristics and a divergent mode of induction. Sleep, however, is obtained in both, and this is their superficial and obvious point of union. So superficial and so obvious that the ordinary observer would scarcely fail to identify them, while they have also been identified on grounds which are not precisely those of ordinary observation. Between occult science and mystic science, there is the common point of union which is created, let us say, by their secrecy. Beneath this fantastic resemblance, there is the more important fact that they both profess to deal with the inner and otherwise uninvestigated forces of the human soul. In the case of occult science, it is, however, for the kind of end which we connect with the notions of magic, for example, talismanic magic, so-called, is ostensibly the art of infusing a certain recondite spiritual power into some object composed artificially. This is an operation of occult science because it deals with a power which is, by the hypothesis, of an occult or generally unknown nature and applies it in accordance with the formulae of a concealed instruction. A knowledge of the powers which are latent in human nature is not unlikely to lead to mysticism, which is the development of the latent powers in the direction of divine union. There is usually, however, no person less really mystic than the occultist conventionally understood. 
The points of contact between occult science and the Kabbalah are very numerous, but between mysticism and the Kabbalah they are, comparatively speaking, few. It is difficult to name a branch of occult science which is not indebted for some development, though not as we have seen in most cases for a governing direction, to the tradition of the Jews, so far at least as the West is concerned. This is true in a degree even of astrology, though it must be said frankly that its rabbinical aspects are often highly fantastic, confined by their ignorance to the most general conclusions and based upon absurd principles as appears most explicitly, though not with intention, in the defense of Gafarel. Ceremonial magic in the West had, as we have seen, its root in Kabbalism. So had all methodized divination, while the connections of alchemy with the Esh Metzarev have been the subject of a special study. It seems unnecessary to prolong the thesis of the present section. The end of mysticism is the recovery or attainment of consciousness in God. The secret doctrine of the creation as that of the emanation of souls written symbolically cannot in the absence of the key which will open its mysteries be of any use to the mystic, nor can the key itself, which is the successful methodizing of the confused Kabbalistic medley provide more than intellectual knowledge, even by the most extreme hypothesis. Should he enter within the circle of initiation where that key is said to be obtained, the student will in due time be in a position to know whether the secret knowledge which underlies such symbolism can contribute to the success of his enterprise. But it is not impossible that a knowledge so obtained will take him far from any traditions of Israel. I have never met with any mystic except those of the natural order, owing as such nothing to literature or traditions, who ignored the possibilities concealed behind Kabbalistic symbolism, or on the other hand owed anything of importance to the Kabbalah. I have never met with any mystic, as distinguished from occult students concerned with the offices of magic, who had so much as a tolerable acquaintance with the subject. Finally, the greatest students of occult science within my acquaintance have been invariably taken further afield. It must be confessed, however, that the question is complicated by a number of issues to which it is impossible to do justice in a brief space. But it may be clearly set down that as mysticism, properly disengaged from its adventitious associations and regarded essentially, is a sacramental experience of the soul, not a system of cosmology, not a doctrine of spiritual essences constructed hypothetically, so it has at best but an extrinsic connection with Bereshith and Merkava, as in like manner with all that we understand conventionally by the occult sciences. We have now reached the term of our inquiry, and a small space only can be spared to a summary of its results. As regards the documents of Kabbalism, we take our stand with that later and better scholarship the position of which is indicated by Dr. Schiller, Zinus's admirable article on the Midrashim. We reject entirely the German school of Dr. Greitz, whose popular English exponent is Dr. Ginsberg. We regard the Zoharic writings as the growth of some centuries. We believe that they represent a tradition which connects with Talmudic times. We respect the legend by which that tradition is identified with the name of R. Simeon ben Jokai, but we are not pledged thereto. We admit that the final shape assumed by the Zohar may not have been much anterior to the date of its publication. We do not deny that it may have received additions which deserve to be described as spurious, or that some of its increment may be attributable to Moses de Leon, but we receive every statement with regard to this personage tentatively and under all reservation, ascribing little evidential value to the account in the Sefer Yuhasin, and confessing that outside it there is perhaps no ground for supposing that such a rabbi flourished in the 13th century. We consider that the period of our Akiba is not an unwarrantable date to ascribe to the Sefer Yetzirah, or to some earlier form of that document, but the extent to which it antedated the ninth century must remain conjectural. We observe in the Sefer, Yetzirah, and the Zohar certain doctrines which, in some form or other, belong to all occultism. They are part of its burden, but they go far back into antiquity. We believe these doctrines to have been derived by the Jew in his early settlements and captivities. We regard the other doctrines of the Zohar, insofar as they follow from Scripture, to be of various and chiefly unassignable dates and periods. But insofar as they are philosophical subtleties or theosophical fantasies, we regard them as largely post-Talmudic. 
We look upon the Kabbalistic writings as documents of humanity, and among such as memorials of the genius of Israel possessing their connections with other systems and other modes of thought, but by correspondence, by affiliation, by filtration, by causal identity rather than by historic descent. We look upon the Zohar in particular as one of the most attractive curiosities of the human mind, full of greatness and littleness, of sublimity and folly. The interest which it aroused on its appearance has in some measure survived all criticism, and the work itself has lived down even the admiration of its believers. We hold that it can be accounted for naturally and historically as a genuine growth of its age, and not either as an imposture or as the key of all esoteric knowledge. It contains few or no traces of that doctrine of secret religion which occultists look for therein. It is the theosophical doctrine of Jewry. It supposes and involves the whole claim of Jewry, and as such its acceptation in any serious teaching sense is intolerable to the modern mind, and would not be worth arguing were it not for the strong trend of occult thought in its direction. The existence of a concealed doctrine of religion perpetuated from antiquity cannot be proved by recourse to Kabbalistic literature, and insofar as this notion has been rested thereon, it is to that extent discounted. Yet the question itself does not stand or fall by the Kabbalah. Speaking from the transcendental standpoint for the first time, as I feel warranted to do in concluding, I venture to say that it is in Christian channels that this doctrine must be sought by those who assume it, by which I mean that the transcendental succession has passed into the Church of Christ. The question, however, is not approachable from the historical side, and in no real sense of the term can it be said to possess such a side. It is therefore outside the common channels of inquiry. And assuming for the moment that any person now living in the flesh is entitled to affirm its existence, then he best of all, though not he only, is aware that the secret doctrine is not of this world. The historical association of the Kabbalah with occult science in the West could not, of course, have taken place without a common ground between them and the occult students who are concerned practically with the alleged efficacy of theurgic formulae with the physical possibilities said to be indicated under alchemical symbolism, with certain side issues of astrology, as with the historical aspect of all these subjects, must not ignore the Kabbalah, for which reasons the rigid demarcation of its sphere of influence and operation has been much needed, and has been here attempted as it is believed for the first time. Thank you for watching and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe and comment and if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Roses links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.